All right, snappy title, yes, and I'd hazard a guess that no, most of you watching this are not actually addicted to video games, but you may have started to see this floating around, this advertisement on YouTube and elsewhere in Google's advertising portal, for something called Guardian Legal Network. You may be owed compensation. That's the hook, I suppose. Everybody wants a payday. But what's more interesting is that Guardian Legal Network is facilitating a lawsuit now against pretty much every single AAA gaming publisher on the basis that their games are inherently and deliberately addictive. To be completely honest here, Guardian Legal Network is not an actual collection of lawyers. It's an advertising service that pairs victims with lawyers. And the whole thing reeks of a legal scam. Get a bunch of people, tell them, oh my gosh, you've been harmed so very much, and then sue a company and keep all the money for yourself by jacking up the cost of your time that you spent building the case. But the thing that really got me thinking is that video games kind of actually do have a blind spot right now. Yes, the title is grabby. No, you, the audience watching this right now, probably don't have an actual medically definable addiction to gaming. But the industry is increasingly predicated on addiction. Games are intentionally designed to be addictive. Cross-pollination between video games and traditional casino gambling is rising exponentially, and whether or not I agree or disagree with the premise of this new class action lawsuit, it's very possible that they will make headway, and I wanted to have a reasonable discussion about why. First things first, again, independent from whether or not we agree with this, Internet Gaming Disorder is an official classification of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, also known as DSM-5 as well as a classification by the WHO in ICD-11. It's a substance-related addictive disorder, which kind of builds the necessary legal foundation needed in order to have some sort of lawsuit. Second, and far more importantly, there is a huge amount of cross-industry influence between gambling and video games far beyond the scope of what most players actually realize, and that is likely where the bulk of targeting will occur. I don't think anyone will fully disagree with this, but loot boxes actually are gambling. Loot boxes, whatever you decide to call them, like surprise mechanics if you're electronic arts, are unregulated, deliberately targeted, underage gambling mechanics with a paper-thin disguise aimed at normalizing them for a video game audience. When it comes to governmental regulation, the wheels are slow, very slow, obviously, but the entire core premise of randomized loot box monetization with a rarity curve and different reward qualities is actually worse than traditional gambling in many cases, because the RTP, the return to player, and the specific odds of winning what you want, when you want, are either significantly lower than mandated casino minimums by law, or undisclosed. That one's easy. We all know that. We all hate it, and loot boxes are an invasion of gambling into modern video games that need to stop. But what we don't focus on as much is how pervasive the other similarities are becoming. To explain this, I need to talk about two concepts, intrinsic and extrinsic player motivation. Intrinsic player motivation is the good stuff. It's basically the holy grail of game design, and it takes place when a player is motivated to perform tasks in a video game based on personal enjoyment of the actual experience. It's effectively when you perform an activity because you enjoy the activity itself, which is theoretically how most video games should be if they're actually built as entertainment products. Extrinsic motivation is when the player performs a task primarily for some sort of incentive, and you can break this down into multiple separate formats, such as rewarding the player for their completion or performance during the activity, etc. But the key takeaway is that extrinsic motivation is the art of capturing a player's time, even when they might not actually want to be doing the activity itself. They want the reward, but they're not playing because the activity itself is fun. They're playing because it's a vehicle to get the dopamine hit they actually desire. And that's a different thing, right? See the difference? Here's the part where I need an example, and please do keep in mind, I'm not saying anything bad about this game. I'm just using it to briefly explain why the industry might have a bit of a blind spot right now and why an organization like Guardian Legal Network has decided to step forward and start kind of preying on people, I guess, if I had to put it in those words. Vampire Survivors, that's the example. Funnily enough, Vampire Survivors is actually described as addictive by pretty much every single person who praises it. It won multiple game awards, including Best Debut Indie Game, and for good reason but it also contains heavy emphasis from the casino industry. Game designer Luca Gallant previously worked in the gambling world and distilled his experience there down into an indie game predicated on the idea of capturing player attention for just one more game as long as humanly possible, leading to this. This is, again for the sake of example, Baron Von Games describing the title in his video called Vampire Survivors is the best video game of 2022 so far, and here's what he said. 
I'm really excited to show you this game, but I'm also kind of worried. Um, well, if you watch at least three to five minutes of this game, I promise you, you're going to be like, okay, I get it. And then you have to, you're going to have to battle <laughs> this game because it's addictive. That is just the facts of it. You're going to have to battle this game because it's addictive. That's just the facts of it. I thought that was extremely interesting, but it really is just one example in a larger pattern. See, even though the topic of addiction is actually quite serious, video game culture has a bit of a different relationship to that word. For video games, addictive is a superlative word. Addictive means good. It means you want to play more, and it gets used synonymously with the word fun. I've done it myself. It's a very common way to speak about video games. Fundamentally, there's no problem there until you start to realize the overlap. Why? Because the relationship where video games are drawing inspiration from the extrinsic motivation of casinos is not a one-way street. Casinos are also gamifying their property with increasing speed, including slots, loyalty programs, and even dealer games. This means that we have two different industries, distinctly different at a previous point in time, that are now drawing from each other with increasing speed. On one side, gambling is augmented and disguised in order to be used as monetization techniques, while on the other, gameplay mechanisms are distilled, refined, included in slot machines or other payout-based activities to maximize player engagement ratios. Here's another example. Call of Duty World War II, the 2017 installation of the franchise, allowed players to get rewards from watching other people open loot boxes. For anyone who misunderstands why that's important, from the Morris Psychology Group, quote, Casinos actively control their sound environment. Most use upbeat music to create excitement, but they also use ringing bells or sirens to signify that people are winning. When people see and hear that others are winning, it creates a sense of possibility and even an expectation of winning." End quote. See, again, the same techniques used by casinos, extrinsic motivation techniques, are invasively prevalent now in video games. Here's another example. Psychology of the near miss originally rose to prominence in gambling, now frequently utilized by video game publishers all over the industry, and the list goes on. Of course, with all that said, most players probably don't meet the threshold necessary to consider them addicted. Addiction is often classified when there is a significant amount of harm being caused, typically financial or social or something like that. But progression boosting or time-saving microtransactions in mobile video games, those are painstakingly constructed and targeted so that they pop up when you are in the most vulnerable state possible after intentionally disguising the true cost of those purchases by converting everything to some sort of in-game currency or premium currency, which also plays on your psychological vulnerabilities by having a discount structure baked into it at checkout. As if I need further examples, and this one's been talked about for years here on YouTube, there are entire development conferences where the subject is how to hunt whales by getting players to initially pay money, break the ice, then addict them to the extrinsic motivation loop and harvest as much as humanly possible. Zynga, owned by Take-Two Interactive, which is hilariously not present on Guardian Legal Network's list, even though it includes Rockstar, has an entire internal system for identifying the highest spending VIPs and keeping them on the hook, much like casinos, which have utilized similar VIP programs for decades. Speaking to GamesIndustry.biz, Vice President of Player Success Gemma Doyle says, quote, We've done so much experimenting at Zynga with VIP. We know what's the frequency of contact. We know what call types work. We know what times to call. We know exactly who to call and when. We know who has a higher propensity to be more susceptible to our call, end quote. Because Zynga has an internal structure to identify when someone slows down their spending, at which point they, quote, need to reach out and call them to find out what's wrong, end quote. See, the cross-pollination between video games and casinos is rising rapidly. The same tricks that were used by gambling establishments to prey on addiction are being used by video game publishers now to create addiction. And yet we, as an audience, happily refer to the addictive nature of these games in a positive way. My point here with all of this? Gaming has a bit of a blind spot right now. Sure, a reasonably priced indie game that uses skillfully crafted extrinsic motivation techniques picked up from the casino industry certainly isn't a problem by itself. But when you consider the wider industry, it starts to make a lot more sense why a coalition of lawyers will have hired an advertising firm to plaster their you might be owed damages post all over social media for personal gain. Ultimately, I can't possibly predict what will actually happen here. But if I had to, here's my guess. 
A large collection of lawyers will harvest a huge amount of money from a group of people who either A, think that they can get an easy payday, or B, actually have an addiction problem. And after dragging the process as far as they possibly can, the lawyers, those victims will get a very small, very, very small payout after a settlement is reached so that a very few specific gaming publishers, the most egregious examples on the list probably, can avoid bad press. That's about it. Over time, maybe the trend will start to slow down or even back off a little bit, but the meshing of these two industries is lucrative for both parties involved, so I don't see it slowing down anytime soon. That's it, though. If you want to support the channel, please check out the links down below. We finally have an actual merchandise line. Took a while, I've wanted to do that for quite a long time, but couldn't actually make it happen till now, and pre-orders are open for 30 days. Outside of that, there are some affiliate products like a VPN, buy that through the channel link if you're interested, or locals in Patreon, but I'll cut it there and stop rambling. As always, question everything and have a nice night.